All right, that's enough. Don't get too friendly. People will start thinking we're the happiest people on earth. I like the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. It's just got the most awful acronym. FBG, you know, there you go. Well, anyway, I'm sure it stands for something funnier than Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. But good to be here. I have a long history with uh, the fellowship and just really want to honor uh, just the older folks that loved me a few years ago and uh, helped me people in their 70s and 80s who really helped a young drug addict who'd come to know Jesus at the age of 21 from the Full Gospel uh, Fellowship, actually. So, uh, yeah, just really want to honour those guys. And thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Spears, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you. Uh, And risking your entire reputation. (laughs) That was worth it, wasn't it? (laughs) That's good. Um, And uh, thank you to the other leaders for laying on such lovely food. Uh, It's been really fun, hasn't it? Nice time. Who wants to hear a white guy speak Māori? Even have to do like a different face, eh? So, kia ora tēnā koutou katoa, ko tipani toko ingoa, no whakatū aho, ko bono toko papa, Ko Queen Elizabeth Toko Mama. <laughs> Ko Thames Te Awa. Ko Cotswolds Te Mauna. They're like little bumps though. <laughs> Toko Hio Waru, Waruna Tamariki Roto Etefano. Who got that? Waru. Waruna Tamariki. That's it. Eight children in my family. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'll leave it there because you're all looking a bit blank. I mean, it's all, it's all very well for the Indians to look blank, you know what I mean? But for goodness sake, white people, we are a bilingual country. Man, what are they like? What's your first language? Div- oh. Hindi. Come on, come and stand up here. Come and greet everybody in Hindi. Namaste, everyone. Now, Amen. That's, too, that's too commercial. You've got to do it kind of the full-on blessing of God. <laughs> oh, we want that. We want that. Come on. Namaste, namaskaram to you all. That's beautiful. Come, bit more, bit more. Go on. Just Amen. No, no, it's too religious. <laughs> <laughs> I love Indians. Are you from India? Uh, Fiji. Yeah, yeah. Fiji. <laughs> I love people of ethnic Indian descent. (laughs) I run a company in Auckland and I am the only person with white skin. They are all from India and Sri Lanka. I'm surrounded and all of their wives, you know what they do every lunchtime? They bring me nice Indian food to eat. (laughs) What a chicken? Always, always something like that. It gives you veggie dishes. Well, it's lovely. Good to see you, Diva. God bless, God bless. (laughs) We're long lost friends as of about three minutes ago. (laughs) All right, so, um, hey, look, I'm just going to tell you my story tonight. If you get bored, the best thing you can do is just go. (laughs) (laughs) That's so boring. I'll get the hint. <laughs> we just stop mid-flight. But um, I want to tell. I want to tell you my story. Is that all right? I'll just tell you my story. Show you some family pictures. Is that all right? To be sure, be sure. I tell you what. We got the firebrands here at this conference. Did you hear the one about the Irishman, the Englishman, and the Scotsman? He's here, isn't he? Did you see him? Can you believe there's a whole nation of people like Danny Smith? And you wonder why there's a thing called football hooliganism. <laughs> Mate, that's what they're like when they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you imagine what they're like when they're filled with six pints of beer? <laughs> Dear Jesus. Man, he was on fire today. <laughs> Man, got it going on. I've got something to compete with now, haven't I? Be yourself, Stephen. Relax. Okay, I will. 
Good job, Danny. Didn't he do well? Didn't he do well? <laughs> he did great. Danny Smith, my life. We're going to have some fun this weekend, I think. And uh, if you don't know Jesus tonight, you are in the middle of the weirdest group of people <laughs> in Hamilton. Even the mayor has got the lurgy. <laughs> but most of us, some of us, unlike the mayor, which was a great testimony, Mayor Andrew, thank you, your lovely wife there. That is your wife, not your sister. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you never know in Hamilton. You know, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you do realise I'm not a preacher, but a stand-up comedian, don't you? You did... Oh. Anyway, um, it's, uh, that, there are people who weren't brought up in the church, and I is one of them. So I don't know too much religious lingo. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's good, actually. So it means I talk normally. Uh, so if you don't know Jesus, um, it's okay. Uh, you might get to know Jesus here tonight, and that would be just wonderful. Um, I never thought that that was possible to actually know Jesus personally, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I won't take too long, um, but I want to show you some videos of my family background. Uh, so in Maori tradition in New Zealand, we often do something called uh, a whakapapa or a mihi, where we, where we talk about our ancestors, you know, talk about where we've come from, uh, my dad, my granddad, things like that. I'm going to do that in the form of a, a National Geographic clip that was uh, made about my family, um, and uh, it'll make some sense when I play the video. Uh, so this is my uncle, and you'll see pictures of my grandparents, and uh, my dad, and my dad's brothers and sisters. I'll just play you a quick video. For decades, Dublin's underworld was hidden. Its key players remained in the shadows. But in this film, the man some have called the godfather of Irish crime tells us his story for the first time. And he went out all over the country and he brought me back hundreds of weapons. And I turned them over to the people who needed them. Dublin today is an attractive, modern European city. But after the Second World War, the newly independent nation of Ireland was struggling. Thousands of families lived in appalling conditions. Two men born into this dire poverty would grow up to be key players in Dublin's underworld. One was the anarchic Martin Carhill, later nicknamed the General. The other was Christy Dunn, the head of one of Ireland's most notorious criminal families. Now 73, he says he's retired from crime, but opens up about his criminal past. When we were kids, we uh, robbed, really. When my father was locked in prison, my mother uh, found it hard and uh, we just took it upon ourselves to make sure she had, you know, the comforts around her. Dunn was the oldest of 17 children. When his parents went to find work in England, he was left in charge. I'd have to cook for them, prepare them for school, advise them to do the right things and all that kind of stuff, especially don't get caught. But Dunn himself was caught for burglary at the age of 12 and sent to a reform school run by Catholic monks. The harsh regimes at these schools were intended to turn young thieves away from crime, but for some, it had the opposite effect. It made things worse for me, and uh, the brutality and the deprivation was just unbearable. The hunger and the cold and the loneliness of the place against discrimination and were attacked by the police. Their plight prompted some south of the border to take action. Now free from jail, Christy Dunn was in the thick of it. He was charged with handling a haul of stolen food, which he claims was destined for starving Catholics a hundred kilometers north. They were practically under siege in the north of Ireland in certain areas. We, uh, had a lorry load of food which was stolen from uh, a company in Dublin named Mako. Dunn went even further, forging a link to Sour Era, a paramilitary group. They secured guns and used them to carry out a string of robberies 
as a way of raising money to help the fight in the north. Tony Hickey. So that's my, uh, my uncle Christy, who I get to see regularly um, when we go back to Ireland. There's my dad, and there's me as a little boy with my ma and my two ugly sisters. I was a bit like Cinderella. <laughs> and uh, my dad is one of 17 children. We're Irish Catholics, no contraception and no TV. Um, but uh, unlike, unlike other large families, my, my grandparents really had a big family to fund the family business, which was crime. And at eight years old, if you can learn to pick pockets, at 10 years old, you'll be able to do cars. And if you can do cars at 10, you'll be doing banks when you're 16 and pulling a balaclava over your head and pointing your gun at a bank manager. And most of my dad's brothers were involved in armed robbery. Um, crime uh, doesn't pay. That particular type of crime wasn't enough for them. So 25 grand on one hit wasn't enough for most of my uncles. So they realized there was more money in the late 70s. They realized by importing heroin into Dublin in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, that there was way more money in drug racketeering. So they, they were importing in from Colombia and from Morocco. Uh, I actually preached in the Liberties area in Dublin just over the last couple of years. And a fella comes up to me my age, in my 40s, and he said, I put half a million euro into that arm there. He'd pumped half a million dollars worth, half a million euro of heroin into one arm, and Jesus had saved him six months earlier, just, just as we were talking. And he said, and, and the drugs that went into my arm, every single one of them was dealt to me by your family. I gave a public apology to uh, the people on those streets, and it's just hard who you come from, where you come from sometimes. Most of my uncles have done time for uh, either shooting coppers or or uh, whatever, you know, drug-related drug stuff. So we, we can talk a little bit about that maybe another time. Uh, but that was me when I was four years old. If I have any, any inner healing problems and need for prayer, it's because my mother turned my hair into a German helmet. <laughs> That's cruel. You should not do that to children. They should call SIFs when you see a child looking like that. Mum did say, <laughs> I was born in 1969, so that was 1973. Uh, Mum did say, smile next year, Stephen, so I did. <laughs> that shirt looks pretty retro, though, eh? It's pretty flash, I reckon. Um, here's, uh, our, here's my lovely wife, Emma, and uh, we'll talk about our background in a minute. We've been married for, uh, let's see, how many years now? 26 and a bit years. That's awesome, isn't it? And uh, we met when we were 15 and 16, so we're childhood sweethearts which is uh, quite wonderful. Uh, so I'm from this funny little country here. This country here, this, this is a very important country just here. Can we have a grunt, please, from anyone from Scotland? <laughs> Come on, we've all watched Braveheart. We all think it's as glamorous as that. And all the English are kind of pale, beige, eh. The Scottish are coming, and the, and the Scottish are like, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, with their American accents. So, right, there you go. So, could we have a little bit of a Scottish grunt, please, for that lovely country up there where no one lives? <laughs> <laughs> you got to love them. We love each other when we're in New Zealand, but put us back in Glasgow, it'd be a nightmare. I couldn't walk into a pub in his town. <laughs> Anyway, I come, from a little, I come from a little town called Oxford. Hello. Hello, Danny. Yes, awfully sorry about that. My dad comes from Dublin, uh, so we're a bit of a mix. We've got the Celtic mix, the real deal going on in here tonight. Um, and uh, my dad travelled over to Oxford, married my mum. My dad's Catholic, my mum's Protestant, so we're way confused, man, about the Reformation and all that. Anyway, um, so it ended up looking like that when I was 18 and, and 18. <laughs> I don't know if that's transgender. It looks kind of transgender, new romantic. I don't know what it is. Anyway, I, I do know this, that that girl doesn't look like she's happy with that guy. But we've, we've been married now. We've got eight kids. So that's, there's hope. I think probably the best word we could put over the top of that young people would be potential. <laughs> Jesus, I'm glad Jesus looks down on people like that and says... I'll just take a little look down uh, that little Hells Angels bar, see if I've got any potential followers down there. I think I'll have a little look. 
yeah, I know he's addicted to pornography. I know he can't stop masturbating. I know that she's, she's anorexic. I know that she's got bulimia and doing speed. I know that she's an acid trip and she, she gave up her transvestite boyfriend so she could date him. I know they're all screwed up and messed up and listen to real wild music. I know they want to change the world and they're insecure and worried what people think so they spike up their hair and try to look really tough. I know, but I can see their heart. I'm going to get right in there. I'm going to get right in there, and I want to meet those two, because I quite like them a lot. And he did. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't it good who God chooses? Pat yourself on the back and say, I'm glad he chose me. I'm glad he chose me. So uh, there's my whanau now, my family. I took ages to get that photo to get, get right, honestly. Trust me, that fella on the end is not my son, even though he looks like me. He married my daughter. I had the stick and the big talk ready, but he's so lovely. I just give him a kiss and a hug now. He's taken my awful daughter off my hands. <laughs> she's not that awful. She's lovely. I'm only kidding. Relax. They got married last year. She's 18, and he was only 17. He had to get his mum's permission to marry my daughter. And she wasn't pregnant. She, they just love each other, and we thought, go for it, guys. You can now have legal sex. Okay. Well, why try before you can buy? I don't believe in Western culture. Sorry, I'm a kingdom of God person. Soz. Soz, not soz. I just don't do the Western thing. Anyway. So that was me when I used to look like Tom Hanks. <laughs> I got married at about 12, by the looks of things. <laughs> I'm not sure. Actually, I was 21, I think. But uh, anyway, so that was our wedding day. That's Emma, when we got married. And uh, you're not bored, are you? Am I boring you? Just yawn. No, you're okay? All right, well, keep you, keep you cooking. Okay, I'll just keep clicking the photos. So there's our family now. That was Ruby's wedding, my daughter. There's my wife, Emma. And uh, there's Ruby and James. Look. Isn't that lovely? So we've got one son who's not in the photo, Judah, who is Māori. He's, um, he's in England at the moment. And, uh, but that's our family, which is nice, isn't it? Nice little family for a white people. <laughs> Questions? How much toilet paper do you buy? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Are you ever able to be intimate with your wife without your kids knowing? Not in my house. Just unbelievable, our house, honestly. And we've got others living with us as well, so I don't know who's who. There's always someone at the table eating my food. <laughs> who are you? Love it, really. I'm only kidding. So um, that's our little family. Very good. Oh, that's me at work, just in case uh, you thought I went to work looking like this. I run a company in, uh, in Auckland. And uh, Craig, do you mind uh, those two, uh, Ruth, those two T-shirts down there? This is our company. Hold them up, Craig. Look, Craig's going to be the model. Not that one, because that's the one I gave you, mate. Not that one. Okay, so there's our company, nice painting company. Look at these models. Look at our two models. So who, look at this, who would like a free T-shirt tonight? Oh, that lad there, that, your hand went up first, bro. See that guy in the, in the red and black check? Look, he was quick, man. Look at that, his hand, that kid's hand, you can go grab one off. Oh, sorry, it's a bit big for you there, mate, but you'll grow into it. You're all right. That's good. All right, and Ruth, Ruth is going to throw, I want to give this one to uh, somebody who was not born in New Zealand and you were adopted. You're adopted, not born in New Zealand. Okay, someone who's adopted in this room, in New Zealand, you know. Yeah, at the back there, Mr. Shoes and the man, that, that shirt will go with your shoes, mate. Look at this guy's shoes. Come on now, show us your shoes. Look at this guy's shoes. Look at those shoes. Best shoes in the house. I thought I had the best shoes. Wow. We've got another Emma. That's nice. That looked lovely on you, mate. Very nice. Anyway, here's some of our guys. Uh, so I work in Auckland uh, organizing painting teams and uh, painting new properties, lots of development in Auckland. Um, we employ about 25 mainly Muslims uh, and Hindus, and uh, mainly from India, Sri Lanka, 
and uh, China, uh, China and M Malaysia. Um, a great little cruise of, of guys. Uh, here's some of my brothers from other mothers. So if you're wondering if, uh, if uh, radical Muslims are dangerous, I'll be talking about radical Islam uh, over the weekend. I'll be talking a lot about Islam this weekend and the present danger that uh, uh, what's things that are happening in the West. Uh, but here's just some Muslim friends, just to, just to show you how cool uh, it is to work with radical Muslims or Muslims. Uh, some of them are nominal, some are more devoted. But that guy hugging me like a teddy bear, does he look scary? Mate, he's a radical Muslim, that guy. And I walked into the room when he walked in. I could tell he was a Muslim just by the length of his beard. In fact, someone said, Steve, if you write a, a, write a book on Islamic Jihad, you could really be on the front cover, you know. <laughs> but it, that's quite funny. You can laugh at things like that. It's all good. And you guys, sense of humor? Okay, bring it in. That's it. I pull it in. So anyway, he said to me, uh, he walked in. I said, oh, assalamu alaikum. He said, well, alaikum assalam. He said, are you Muslim? I said, nah. I said, I'm a follower of Jesus. I love God and love the Bible. And I love Muslims. I said, why don't we pray? He said, my God, this would be great. <laughs> Bowed our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for my brothers. Just pray, just before this photo was taken. Oh God, I want to pray for them. Bless them. Fill them with your spirit today as we work on this stinky, smelly job that we've got to do together. In Jesus' name, amen. One of them looked at me like this. The, the, the radical guy just said, amen, amen. You know, he was pleased. One of them looked at me and he went, what are you? <laughs> I said, I'm a follower of Jesus. He went, my God. He said, I have been in New Zealand for four years. He said, I have been looking for a true Christian. He said, when I came to New Zealand, I thought everybody was a Christian. But I not find one for four years. I've been living in Christchurch for four years, not find one. But now I find a true Christian after four years. Amazing. Perhaps we need to pray for a few more Muslims. Hey? Hello? I'll say it again. Perhaps we need to pray for a few more Muslims. Wakey, wakey. So these are just some of the guys. Uh, n not everyone makes it. Uh, this is uh, my dear, dear friend, Sumida, who came as a, an asylum seeker in New Zealand. And shortly after this photo was taken, the, the threat that he had, uh, um, I can't go into too much details because we're being recorded, but basically from his home country, the, the threats that he had, if he would be deported, he was due to be deported, just was too much for him. He'd given his life to Jesus. He was water baptized, was in a Bible study that we were secretly doing for Muslim, follow, Muslim background followers of Jesus. And uh, shortly after this photo was taken, he committed suicide. And um, interestingly, I, I, I went to the funeral, obviously, uh, surrounded by uh, 150 people, all from his ethnic background. I won't say what it is because of the video. But um, <clears throat> went to hit the funeral, and the guy who was taking the funeral just broke down in tears. We were all sobbing. And they asked me to take the funeral, and I ended up taking the funeral in front of like I say, 150 different ethnicity people to me. And out of that funeral, amazingly, two or three teams of painters have come to work for me. Uh, so my company kind of blossomed out. It's the weirdest thing. This was last August. So not everyone makes it when you're working among refugees and asylum seekers. But just wanted to remember my friend, Sumida. So there's Emma and I. Uh, looking a little bit more wrinkly, but never mind. A little bit of wisdom. Here's some of my children. I'll just whiz through these real quick. Yum, 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 yum. Some of them came out that quick as well, I'll tell you. <laughs> and there they all are. There's the local Presbyterian church in Nelson, where I live. No, it's not. It's my family. Okay. Um, hey, we do run a charity, and it, there's a, a little card on your... Uh, uh, on your table. Um, please take these with you. Um, and on the back, there's a bank number. And if you're filthy rich and uh, want to sell a field or your farm and donate all the money to the Jeremiah Trust, it'll be a worthy cause. If you ain't got much money, don't worry about it. I'm not after your money, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, if you do have excessive millions, just pop it in there. 
no questions asked, that would go to a great charity. Um, so we, we offer um, housing and uh, uh, for women who are planning an abortion. New Zealand has one of the highest abortion rates in the OECD and women who are in an awkward situation uh, planning an abortion, we'll offer to house them and then adopt the child if they don't want the child, regardless of how the child was conceived or regardless of the condition of the child, whether the child is disabled or, you know, whatever, mixed race, all those sorts of things. Um, so that's something that we do, and you can talk to me about that over the course of the weekend if you so would like. I've got a video to play, but I won't play it just in the interest of time. Uh, this is one of my daughters. This is Promise, just to give you a quick story. Um, I'm telling you this just uh, to help you, uh, help some of you capture the father heart of God. Uh, we, were, we were in Starship Hospital some years ago, and God's with one of our children that was quite sick. We seem to have a history of sick children. And uh, we were in Starship. It was quite critical, newborn. And um, God spoke to my wife in that, in that hospital and said, you will adopt a child from this hospital that nobody wants. And it will be a prophetic sign of the father heart of God to the nation. She's like, wow. So she went, you know, she's got, already got a sick child and she goes running up to the social worker in Starship, you know, have you got any children up here that nobody wants? And of course the social worker's like, darling, I think you just need to go back to your room and care. <laughs> for your sick baby. You're obviously having a bit of a hard time. She went, no, no, like God spoke to me. I'm looking for a baby. She went, no, 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 not right now. You just care for your baby. Is your baby okay? No, 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 you stupid woman. We waited three years for the call. We've done lots of foster care and adopted children in between, but we waited three years and we got the call. Starship called us the social worker called us. They knew we were keen to adopt a child that no one else wanted, and this child had been left. She'd been given a different name to the name we gave her. We gave her the name Promise, Promise from God. And uh, she was born with Down syndrome, leukemia, heart disease, lung disease. At the, at the taking of this photo, she'd already had two uh, blood transfusions. She had twisted colon, um, and then we took her through heart surgery. So the doctors healed her heart, and Jesus, over a period of three months, healed her lungs. One lung was completely collapsed. She was on a ventilator, and uh, the, the other lung inflated, and both, both got better. Um, she was given six months to live, and uh, we took her, adopted her fully. Uh, probably the most anointed experience I've had with God. This will bless you, Andrew. The most anointed experience I've had with God wasn't in a church service, it was in Tomaranui County Court, just uh, signing the adoption papers, living in Tomaranui. They'd just finished chasing the mongrel mob leader around the court because he'd done a runner. And then they saw our case to sign promise over for the adoption. And the judge did, Mr. and Mrs. Dunn, mm -hmm, they have to sign it off, blah, blah, blah. And someone takes notes. Very legal, very clinical environment. The judge put his pen down and he said, I'd like to say a few words off the record. If there were more people in this country like Steve and Emma Dunn, this country would be a better place to live in. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to puff myself up. I'm just saying the anointing of God came upon me that day. And I thought, man, we need more men. More men. More men and women with the broken heart of Jesus for what's unwanted in society to display the Father heart of God to society. People don't just need to hear words, they need to see the action. Yeah. Promise was given six months to live. We told our kids, we're going to adopt a baby. Kids all cheered. Got six kids at the time, seven, uh, five or six kids at the time. They all cheered. I lost count, I'm sorry. We just number them now. <laughs> or Danny will get this. Hugh, Pew, Barney McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble and Crow, that's all. You know. That was a funny one for Danny. The rest of you, you don't understand Trumpton. It's all good. You understand, Trump. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. We said, all right, kids, we're going to adopt this child, but she'll be dead in six months. Kids went, yay! I said, you didn't hear me. We're going to adopt a sister. Yay! But she'll be dead in six months. All good, Dad. Six months, right? I said, no, she's going to die. The doctors have said she's too poorly. We're going to put her in a shoebox and bury her on the back of the farm and sing a Jesus song 
They said, yeah, but Dad, you said we could have her for six months, right? <laughs> the mind of a child. Unless you too become like children, you won't enter the kingdom. You've got to see it from a child's perspective. There's an old saying in London. My wife's from London, so she talks like that in it. She says, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Hey, isn't it? Well, we took the risk with promise, and guess what? She didn't die. <laughs> there she is at three. There she is at four with my other kids. And if that's not a picture of someone finding home, she's the happiest little nine-year-old right now that you could possibly want in your family. She is adorable. She's just gone through major hip surgery, and we'll be going through the second hip surgery. We've had about four months incapacitated, and uh, we've, been a, we've spent a lot of time in hospital with this girl, but she is lovely. Look at her. She loves her daddy, I'll tell you. If she was here tonight, she'd be standing here all shy, telling you she loves her mummy and daddy. Isn't that great? It's the father heart of God, wanting what other people don't want. You might feel neglected. You might feel abandoned. You might feel rejected and orphaned. But there's a place called home in the heart of God for every single one of us in this room. That's just beautiful, isn't it? Oh, there she is with her cast. Uh, so that's my daughter, Lydia. Um, but there she is in the hard cast. So we had that for four months. Just, just got taken off. So we're just going through the physio now. That's the crane hoist that we had to have in the house to kind of lift her up so we could wheel her over to the toilet and all that kind of stuff. So it's a bit like a, a hospital at our house. So I just, we all, it's Hillary. <laughs> Hillary, you're famous. Look at that, where's Hillary? There she is at the back, look, you're famous, see? Stand up, Hillary. See, I talk about you everywhere I go, mate. But I won't talk about you now, because people can talk about you to, in person. There you go, I even play your story, Hillary. Um, so here's just some other photos, but um, I, I haven't got time to go through all the... Uh, or the, or the story, but just, just to bring us to a close here, um, Emma, this is a photo of my wife at 15 years old. My mum warned me not to marry, uh, not to date this witch. She said, get the witch out of the kitchen. Emma was such a mess, just involved in the drug scene. I was a singer in a punk band, but somehow deep inside, even stoned off my face, lying on my bed, asking for any ghost to haunt me, anything to happen, just some kind of experience. I would cry out, dosed up on drugs or, or alcohol, or find myself waking up on graves and with vomit coming out through my nose, drunk four nights a week at 16 years old. I would still, there was this longing in my heart for home. There was a longing in my heart. Is there a God? And if there's a God, what does he require of me? Is he really true? Could it be really true? And someone had the guts to come up to these two <laughs> in a bar in North America. We were on a, we'd left England. We'd had enough. The band had split up. And we're, we're on the run in England. I'll, I'll go for about another five minutes, John. Is that, is that all good? Okay. So we're on the run in England and uh, in America. And we're working behind a bar. And a pastor and his wife come into the bar. See, rule number one, make sure you go. When you go for souls, make sure you go onto their turf. Right? Jesus said, go into all the world. He didn't say, go to church, guys, or go to another Christian meeting. Go into all the world. Thank God somebody loved Jesus enough to reach into our heart, and they loved us. They bought us meals. They said their funny little Christian prayers over us when we had to say goodbye at the end of the night. But you know what? I saw something in the eyes of those those two that I can see in the eyes of so many of you here tonight. And it's the presence of God, the love of Jesus burning inside of us. And they loved me. They invited me to their church. Of course I went. We were happy to go to their church. And I couldn't, I interrogated every Christian. I was like every Christian's worst nightmare. Interrogated them. Then I had to go out, for, out the back for a quick smoke and back in again, what about suffering? What about Middle East? What about this? What about the Irish Catholics? What about that then? What do you know about the IRA? <laughs> it's 
Such a flipping wannabe tough guy. I don't know about that photo there. So one Maori guy said, hey, was you in the mongrel mob, bro? <laughs> I said, nah. <laughs> no, it's not the mongrel mob. It's New Model Army. It's a punk band in England. But someone else said, uh, Steve, are you peeing? <laughs> no, I wasn't peeing. I was trying to look tough. Actually, my mum took that photo. The truth behind that photo was it went like this. Mum, mum, oh, what, Stephen? Mum, would you mind just taking a photo of me? I've got my nice jacket on. Oh, all right, then. OK, OK, mum, just hold on. OK, thanks, mum. I'm coming back. So that was me singing in the band. <laughs> and they loved us. That's me on the left. <laughs> and then this old guy... We were traveling. I'll tell you this story, and then we'll go home, all right? Someone's yawning. You're all right. You're all right. You can have medicine for that. It'll stop you. <laughs> Anyone else need a yawn? One's yawning over here. It's kind of contagious. It's like a spirit. <laughs> There's another one yawning there. Look, have a good yawn. Look, that's it. I can see you. I can see everybody. It's my head's facing this way. I can see everything. <laughs> You're dribbling. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I was joking. You weren't dribbling, really. Well, not much. Anyway, just wipe here. That's it. <laughs> We're driving through North America. Our car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, and this fella, very similar looking to this fella called Larry, shows up and helps us with our broken down car. I'm in a place called Pulaski, Virginia, and Larry, this is how we got saved, and Larry, he said, hey, Sonny, he, he sure had a whistle, because he had no teeth, you know? <laughs> hey, Sonny, I said, yeah. He said, uh, you got a problem with your car? I said, well, yes, I have, actually, thanks. But you've got more of a problem with your face, really. I mean, <laughs> he said, and he had this funny nervous twitch. And every time he spoke, the more nervous he got, he kind of went. <laughs> 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 so this is how it came. This is Jesus's ambassador to help me meet Jesus, OK? He only sends the best. Looked very much like that. Pulaski, Virginia, Hickville. Comes up. <laughs> hey, honey, you got a problem with your car? <laughs> I'm thinking, flipping, hey, what is this? I said, well, yeah, I have actually. Anyway, so he opened up the bonnet, the hood, got in there, and he's knocking around. He wasn't doing anything. He was just doing that typical guy thing where you pretend you know what you're doing under the car. He slams it down. He said, no, son. <laughs> he said, I can't fix your car. He said, but let me tell you something. This is midnight. We're in a bit of a rough area in town. He says, uh, I was sitting in my house about 20 minutes ago with my wife, Linda. <laughs> and he said, and the Lord told me, somebody in my town needs help, and I believe it's you. I said, uh, excuse me. I said, um, who told you? He said, the Lord told me. Now, I'd heard about God, because I was from England and Ireland. I'd heard about Jesus, you know, Mary, Joseph, and all the angels. I'd heard all about that, but who's the Lord? I thought, whoever the Lord is, he's obviously big, because he can talk to somebody over there about something going on in, in his town over here. He comes up, he says, and I tell you what, Sonny, <coughs> he says, y'all come back to my house for the night. Now, right there, the warning bells went off. I had pictures in my mind of sticky tape circles stuck to my head with wires coming out to a machine where I would be brainwashed and my wrists tied and people with hooded white cloaks and candles going hum, hum, hum in some kind of seance religious ritual and then my wife being placed on an altar of blood and a night... Oh, sorry, I've been watching too many movies. <laughs> but I had a look at Larry and I thought, no, I could probably take him. It'd be all right, we'll go sit in his car. So he's driving through the car and I'm telling you, we drove, it seemed like an eternity, into the woods of Virginia. <laughs> I was convinced I was going to go into some sort of seance with the druids and burning crosses and candles and all the droids and, you know, you got the picture. Anyway, we end up in Larry's house. There were no seances, no weird crosses, no weirdness, just Larry and Linda. And so we're sitting out on the veranda having a fag 
having a smoke. You can't say having a fag in America. That's inappropriate. <laughs> or these days in the church, it could be postmodern. <gasps> That's another session. We'll talk about that another day. So we're having a cigarette, a smoke on the veranda like you do. And Larry said to us, Steve and Emily, he'd call my wife Emily, her name is Emma. I said, Larry, her name's Emma. He said, no problem. Steve and Emily? <laughs> <laughs> he said, come on in. I want to pray for y'all. I want to pray for y'all. I said, uh, oh, OK, then. Now, I'm Catholic background. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mary, Joseph, and all the angels. Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with you. Oi, tell me, I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus. Amen. That's prayer, right? I said, Right, off you go, a lot of years. That's all I thought prayer was. Larry did the weird thing. Larry did this, John. <laughs> Held my hand. <laughs> I'm a young guy, he's touching my hand. He's touching my hand. <laughs> We're in a circle, three of us praying. He hasn't got carpet on the floor, he's just dusty floorboards. And we start praying, and he starts praying Pentecostal style. So Jesus sends the snotty nose, <laughs> Larry, short of talking like that. And then he starts praying, Dear Jesus, I'm calling on your name, Jesus. I believe you got Stephen Emily in my house tonight, Lord. You got a plan for him, Jesus. I pray for him, Jesus. I pray you'd send him around the world, Jesus. I pray you'd get a hold of him, Lord. Glory. I see you coming on him, Lord. <laughs> well, that wasn't very seeker sensitive, was it? Hey, <laughs> eh? hadn't even done an alpha course. I'm thinking, what is this flipping zoo I've just been welcomed into? <laughs> and I opened my eyes and I caught Emma's eye and I thought, I'm just about to burst out laughing because it is such a funny environment and I'm not kidding. As I began, I opened my eyes to Emma and I thought, I'm just I'm going to lose it. If I catch her eye, that's going to be... <laughs> and then as I caught her eye, I looked on the floor and the dusty wooden floor was receiving splashes of tears on the floor and Larry began speaking in tongues carobo so laco le say jesus touch him lord touch him oh god touch him and we open, both of us opened our eyes at this point and realized there was a fourth person had come into the room the presence and the power of God was in that room. Emma said to me afterwards as we debriefed it over another cigarette, she said, she said, I've never cried over my own soul, yet someone else was so burdened to cry over tears that I've never even shed for my own soul. We began to see the heart of Jesus in dear Larry Lane from Pulaski, Virginia. He was an old, old man, probably with Jesus right now, listening and enjoying it. I hope you are, Larry. Great cloud of witnesses, because it was worth it for that cup of hot chocolate you gave us with marshmallows and the tears you shed on that floor, because look, it produced something, because it was weeks later, it was weeks later that we came to the way. Jesus said, there is no other way to the Father. And I fell on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus, the crucified Jesus, risen from the dead, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that will come again. And he's not coming back to a prayer meeting. He's coming back, according to 2 Thessalonians, to smash the enemies of God. And he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth. And I'm glad about that. I love him. Mercy is extended until that time. Mercy has been extended until that time. And whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord between now and when he returns will be saved. You'll know him. Your life will be changed. Sins that you thought, if you spoke about them publicly, things that you've done, if you, I, I've got stuff in my background. Some of you in this room have got stuff you've seen on the internet, stuff you've touched that's made you unclean and filthy. Jesus can make it clean. 
Jesus saved me, accepted me, and welcomed me. And I so appreciated what Brother Danny said today about the sissy preaching in New Zealand. Thank God for correct, conservative, theological preaching. Jesus loves us the way we are, but he loves us enough not to leave us the way we are transformational inclusion, not affirmational inclusion. I'm sorry for the big words. Oh, he loved me the way I was. He loved me, but he didn't leave me that way, friend. He saved me out of darkness and into the light. And I want to praise him and thank him for that tonight. That's good news, isn't it? That's good news. Amen. Well, I've gone, I've gone past time, but I'm going to do something don't usually do, but this is a bit traditional for Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. Here's how we'll do it. No music. You don't know Jesus tonight. You want to know Jesus tonight. Stand to your feet. You might go to church. You might take communion and have a communion wafer. You can go to hell with a communion wafer in your hand, friend, if you don't know Jesus. You can be on the roll at church. You can be doing creche singing on the worship team, and still not know Jesus. Friend, if you don't know him tonight, I want to encourage you, stand to your feet. It doesn't matter if no one stands, it's all good, in the hood. But if you don't know Jesus and you think, flipping out, someone has just woken in me tonight, that guy has got to me. I know that there are people in this room where you actually think, I've got like a backstory about your life. I can point you out if you want, but I don't know your life. I Trust me, I don't know. No one's told me about you, but the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart right now. And if you don't know him, you know if you know him or not. And if you don't, I want to pray with you. I want you to stand to your feet. You listen to the round of applause you get when you stand to your feet. And that might be the beginning start of a journey for you to be very public about your relationship with Jesus. So if that's you here tonight, would you stand to your feet, please? I'll give you 10 seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, no problem. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we want to thank you for this evening. Thank you for your love towards us. Thank you for your presence here in the room. Lord, we appreciate you. We thank you for the power of one person's story. And we pray tonight, God, that you would touch us, that you would reinvigorate us for souls. We pray that you would put a fire of your spirit in our hearts that would never go out. God, I pray that you would ignite something in us tonight. All right, so here's the second altar call. It's not going to go on all night, don't worry. Promise I won't drag this out or make it weird. If the fire has been on you and you heard Brother Danny speaking, man, I must be saved. I'm calling a Scottish person Brother Danny. <laughs> That's like true unity. You have no idea. You think India, Pakistan? You think India, Pakistan want to kill each other? It's here, mate. There's much more history, mate. You, you fellas, it's nothing, mate. Islamic jihad? Forget it. You've got Scotland and England here. Brother Danny, if you saw some of his fire today and thought, shoot, man, he's making me seem tepid. If you just felt, I want what he's got. If you've seen some of the fire of Jesus in me and you felt the warmth coming to you, but the heat has gone down in you, would you stand to your feet? Danny and I are going to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you for humbling yourself. Thank you, men, for standing up. Thank you, Lord. Danny, why don't you come and join me? Why don't you lead us in prayer, bro? Thank you, Lord. Thank Hallelujah. you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just worship you tonight. Yes, Lord. Father, we worship you tonight, and we thank you. We thank you for the passion, Lord, that you've expressed again tonight through my brother tonight, Lord, even, thank though, you. even though he's English, Lord. But, Lord, I thank you. But I really thank you, Lord, 
for the passion that I see within him, Lord, and the fire that I see within him. And I know, Lord, the passion, Lord, that people, Lord God, need, yes. Father, to change a nation. It's yes, the passion Lord. for you, Lord. It's not religion. You never came, Lord God, to teach and to preach on religion. You came to reveal a kingdom, the kingdom of God. Yes. So, Father, I pray for every person in this place tonight and those who have stood up, Lord God. I thank you for the fire of God. Yes, I thank you for the fire of the Holy Spirit that you would come upon oh. them again, that you would come upon them again, that you would reveal yes, yourself Lord. again in a greater measure, in a greater way, Lord Jesus, that they would experience the dreams and the desires and the things of God like they have never had before. I pray that you would stretch forth your mighty hand yes, right Lord. now in the name of Jesus and cause by revelation that transformation would come by the revelation of the mighty, beautiful heart of the Father that we heard about tonight, that they would know you in a greater way. Jesus, you came to reveal who you really are, and you really are the truth. Yes. You really are the way. You really are the, the way and the life. There is no other life without you, Jesus. Jesus. We are just existing without you, Jesus. So, Father, I pray for the passion, the fire, and the love of God. Yes, we Lord. touch their hearts again. And, Father, because we know that when we are loved, we can love. It's when we are not feeling loved and sense loved, Lord, that we cannot love. So I thank you, Lord, that every person that stood tonight, Father, they would know the love of Jesus, that you would come upon them and you would grab a hold of them, that you would compass them, Lord, with the love of God. That, Father, again, they would be able to express the goodness of God because you are a good God and a good, good Father. So we worship you. We thank yes, you and we praise you tonight for the things that you've done and you will continually do through all these services, Lord, because we give you the glory and we give you the praise yes, and we Lord. give you the honor because there's nothing we can do without you, Jesus. It is you, Lord, we give the glory to. Amen. 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 Thank you, Danny. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Well done. Thank you, bro. Just, just as we close, there's, I, I don't want you to stand. There's young female here. I'll purposely just keep my eyes closed and inside you are just shut down and it has all shut down and you so wanted to stand and it just you just can't you can't trust again it's cold on the inside and you so want to respond tonight you so want to be known internally and Jesus says I know you he know he's saying it right now to you and purposely, I'm going to keep my eyes closed so I don't catch your eye. But he's saying, I know you. I know you. And it's okay. You can trust again. Would that, would that girl, would you just come and talk to um, Tracy, please? Tracy, just give us a wave. Uh, Danny's wife here. Just come and talk to Tracy. She'll pray with you. Or, or one of the leaders up, lady leaders up here. So, Father, we bless you for tonight. We thank you for your presence here. Lord, we pray as we sleep and do other things tonight. Father, before bed, we, we pray, Father, that you would pour your blessing out upon us. Touch us, God, this weekend, we pray, for the glory of your Son's name. Holy Jesus, amen. Amen.